Hi everyone, this is uh, Math 92. This is Shane Briggs, your professor. Um, I'm gonna go through review section one and two. Might be kind of a shorter video. Um, this is the course notebook. So this, this copy, the cover, um, it'll look like this if you get it from the bookstore. Keep in mind you can print this out for zero dollars. Well, at least you'll need to spend money on your printing costs, I guess. But even if you want to spend zero money, you can just look at the PDF and uh, go through this. I, I have made the PDF available um, for download, totally free. I think in the bookstore this thing's about 30 bucks. So, all right. Um, you'll see a table of contents, so it'll kind of break it down not only by section, but also by exam. So you could see like this material is exam one material, and you could see the page numbers that that information is found on and stuff. Um, but yeah, I've kind of tried to break it down into specific exam material within the table of content. Um, so yeah, on to review one. So just to give you a, an overview, I'm going to go through some of these problems. The idea is that you'll go through the others. Um, it's a, of course up to you whether you want to, like in the moment, pause and try something or watch the whole video and then go back. It's obviously up to you, but that, that was the intent of the way I record these. So I'll, you'll notice I'll go through some of these. I'll kind of leave some of them blank. When you're done with the video, uh, just know that I do post the solutions to all the problems. Um, so you can see my handwritten work for all the problems and my video uh, work on some of the problems. So look for that PDF attached next to the video. Um, operations with integers. So we're going to be learning how numbers work, basically, and how to combine numbers with different operations, what the order of operations are, ultimately. Uh, but first, we're getting into specific types of numbers. So we have uh, sets of numbers, and we have different names for different sets of numbers. So if we start at one, two, three, four, and then this dot, dot, dot just means that we continue with that pattern indefinitely, so forever. So this, this pattern identifies that five would come next, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on and so forth. So this is sometimes called the counting numbers, but we're gonna call them the natural numbers. So sometimes called the counting numbers because these are the ones that you typically count on your hands, one, two, three, and so on. Um, when we collect objects inside of these braces, so these are called braces, uh, this is called a set. So a set is just a collection of objects. In this case, we're collecting the natural numbers. <clears throat> so there are other sets of numbers, and, and we'll start building up from here. Um, this set of numbers begins at zero, then goes one, two, three, four, dot, dot, dot again. This ellipses means this goes forever in that way. Um, the only difference between this set and that set, you can see, is the number zero. So very similar to the natural numbers, this is called the whole numbers. Okay, so just the zero. Integers are very similar to the whole numbers, except you can see there's this whole negative side of things. So zero, one, two, three. Um, that would be the whole numbers going that direction, but the integers also include all these numbers going negatively in this way. Um, so negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, and so on. So these are not all of the numbers, right? There's no number 1.5 in here, right? 1.5 is not an integer. But technically, you could imagine that there is another number between 1 and 2, right? We're not stating all numbers here. We're just stating the integers. So this first example, um, let's read it. It says, determine the set or sets, natural numbers, whole numbers, or integers to which all possible numbers described by this statement belong. Explain your thinking. 
So it says the number of people in the classroom next to ours right now. <laughs> I wrote this b before uh, the pandemic, okay? <laughs> so imagine we're in a classroom on a campus. Um, so what we're trying to do here are determine which sets all of these possible results live in, right? So what I'm gonna do first is write down some possibilities. So which numbers are possible? So the number of people in the classroom next to ours, I'm just thinking of like the number of people in the house next to mine, but same, same difference, right? So you could have zero people over there. <clears throat> you could have one lonely person over there. You could have two people over there, three, four, Right? There could be a hundred, theoretically. It's not possible that there are negative one people over there or that there are uh, half a person over there or anything like that, right? There either is at least one person over there or there's no people. So what we're supposed to do now is determine the sets that all of these numbers live in. Okay, so going back to our sets, well, it's totally possible that zero people are in the classroom next to ours, right? So since zero is possible and zero is not in the counting numbers or natural numbers, natural numbers are not going to be one of my sets that I'm gonna state as the X. Looking at the whole numbers, the whole numbers it has zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. That's exactly what we have here. So I will say uh, the whole numbers. And I'm explaining my thinking just through words right now, okay? So the whole numbers are a part of our answer because <clears throat> all of the possibilities can be found within the whole numbers, right? all of the possibilities cannot be found within the natural numbers because of that zero problem. So what about the integers? So I'm looking at the integers. We have zero, one, two, three, four, a hundred. We have a bunch of other possibilities that I didn't write down. If the integers are a part of the solution, then all of these numbers should be able to be found in the integers. Okay, so, and it's, possible, right? Here's zero, I found zero. Here's one, I found one. Here's three, I found three. Four would naturally come next. A hundred is way down here somewhere. So I'll say the integers. Okay, I'll just box those that way. Let's try another one and, and maybe I'll leave uh, part three undone. So it says the daily low temperature as measured to the 10th of a degree Fahrenheit in North Pole, Alaska for one year. So let's write out some possibilities. And these possibilities are no longer numbers of people. These are temperatures of, of this location um, measured to the point one of a degree Fahrenheit. So I'm going to write some possibilities. Some of these possibilities are not very probable, but that's okay. Um, it, it just needs to be possible. So it's possible that it was like negative 1.0, right? Degrees. It was possible that it, it'd be 14.3 degrees right, because we're measuring down to the tenth of a degree, so I could see that on the thermometer. It's possible it could be negative 27 degrees, right, it could be zero degrees, could be not very probable, but it could be 100 degrees. <clears throat> right, so here are some possibilities. What we now need to do for any of these sets up here to be a solution we need to be able to find all of these in that set. Okay, so looking at the, let's start with the natural numbers. <clears throat> There's no possible way of, of finding any negative numbers in here. 
So the first number I wrote down as possible is negative one. Negative one is not in here. So the natural numbers is not gonna be in our solution. <clears throat> Looking at the other possibilities, we have like 14.3. Um, 14.3 is not going to be in any of these sets because this set, this set, all of them would jump right over 14.3. Right down here in this set, we go from 13 to 14, right to 15. Right, there's no 14.3 in that set, and there's no 14.3 actually in any of these sets. And what that would mean is that this possibility can't be found in any of our sets, so none of them are going to work. Okay, I'm going to go to page two and see what's going on over here. So once you have an ordered number system, basically that you know that this number is larger than this number, um, you can start talking about relative size and equality or less than or greater than, all of these things now have meaning once you have an ordered number system. So here's how we say a number is less than a num another number, right? So you could say five is less than 10, for example. So I'll, I'll let you guys read through this. This hopefully is a bit self-explanatory, but basically there are symbols that, it, that attach to all these words, right? And these are those symbols. So let's fill in the blank here. Um, we're supposed to place either a less than or a greater than. So I would say one is greater than negative six. I would say negative 13 is less than negative two actually and zero is greater than negative five. Okay, so the next kind of food for thought is um, talking about distances. So what distance are you from the front of the class right now? You're probably a long distance away because you're not on campus, <laughs> but you're still some distance, right? So. About what distance are you from the front of the class right now? I'm gonna say for me, five miles. You might have a different number. About what distance are you from your house right now? Well, actually I'm zero miles away from my house. Right, so about what distance are you from yourself right now? So I'm gonna say also I'm, I'm zero feet or inches or anything. I'll say zero feet just to make it clear that I'm basically on top of myself. What might this mean for distances? So notice I never said that I'm like a negative distance away from anything. So distance is never negative. In meaning it's either there or it's not. Right? Either there is distance that is, or there's not. It's either there or it's not. And I mean distance by it. So uh, why do I say that? This is kind of the intuitive understanding of absolute value. Absolute value, you may already know, like if you have the absolute value of negative seven, that's seven. But the reason why is, is really what's interesting to me is really you're measuring that number's distance. So when you're saying the absolute value of negative seven is seven, what you're really doing is measuring how far negative seven is from zero, right? There either is distance there or it's not, or it's not there. So if you have absolute value of zero, well, if you're right on top of zero, then you're a distance zero from zero. So that's like, how far are you from yourself? So it doesn't matter what direction you look, you're always talking about, oh, I'm this far, right? You're not, going, you're not saying I'm negative 10 miles away from the ocean or something like that. So the absolute value of a number is the distance between that number and zero. 
okay? <coughs> Sorry, I have a little cough today. Place the numbers in order. So what, what we mean by in order <coughs> is the simplified version, right? So what I'll do is, is I'll actually write it both ways. So if I just write it unsimplified, so if I leave the absolute values present, um, negative two would be the first number, that's the least of all. Absolute value of zero would come next, and I'll just leave it unsimplified. Um, one, it looks like, would come next. All right, so maybe I'll cross these off. And then it looks like four, Absolute value of negative seven, I know that's actually seven. So I'll write that just like it was a seven, right? I'm writing it in seven's place because this literally is the number seven. It's just a strange way of writing it. And then finally, absolute value of 23. <clears throat> so this would be totally fine. Or you could actually simplify and say negative two, absolute value of zero is just zero, one, four, seven, and 23. These are the exact same numbers. Um, on your calculator, there's an absolute value button. <clears throat> this will be the calculator that I'm gonna suggest you use for the semester and please do use it. So here, See where it says HYP? There's actually another option behind that that says ABS. So what I'll need to do actually to access anything in yellow is I'll go shift and then that HYP and then this vertical bar appears. And yeah, you can just say, all right, let's type in a negative seven just to be sure. Okay. Um, all right, so let's look at a couple of these. Um, the opposite of negative nine. So that's kind of how this is meant to be read. So this would mean opposite of negative nine or the opposite of the opposite of nine. So that's like the English of it. And then to actually figure out the value, you could just write down nine if you know it, but just to clarify, please, please feel free to use the calculator. <clears throat> negative times parentheses negative nine. Looks like it didn't want the times there. There we go. All right, so that is just the number positive nine. The opposite of two would just be negative two. The opposite of zero actually is it's, its own opposite. So I'm leaving the English part out. I'll, I'll be, uh, like I said, doing some of these. I encourage you to do these on your own, example five. Um, let's talk about example six though. It says, what is the difference in elevation between the highest and lowest points in the contiguous United States? Okay, um, so how can we write out this problem using an absolute value? So if you look this up, which, which I've done, um, you'll have Mount Whitney, which is in California. And for our purposes, I let's just go with 14,993, I think it was, feet. Please correct me if, if I'm off on that. The lowest point is the Badwater Basin. And that's also in California, actually. And, oh gosh, what was it? It was like minus 270 feet. I'll just, I'll just use these numbers, okay? These numbers might be a bit off, so. But here's the general rule. So if you have this kind of mountain, Mount Whitney, 
And then over here you have this really what's a valley um, for the Badwater Basin. All these heights are measured from sea level, right? So this would be the 14,993, and this would be the 270. And it's negative 270 because we're going in the other direction, right? So we're, we're notating by the use of this negative that we're counting below sea level, <clears throat> okay? So really, we need to figure out this total distance here. So we would need to really add this number to the absolute value of this number. So I'll say 14,993 plus the absolute value of negative 270. Okay, I'll type that in. So that'd be 15,263. Right, if we, if we didn't use the absolute value, you'd just be subtracting 270 from this mountain. So you'd really be getting like this distance. <coughs> All right, next page. Sorry, I'm gonna box this. That's our answer. <clears throat> so a negative times a negative is a what? Is a positive? And, but really I'm curious about why, you know, why that's, that's a, a big part of what I try to do in, in our math classes to not just give you what, but the why. Um, so let's look at a pattern and hopefully this will kind of explain why a negative times a negative is a positive. Okay. So four times two <clears throat> is eight. Why is that eight? Um, so four times two, literally it's kind of all in the English. So four times two, if you think just about what that actually means, it means we take two four times. And how do we take it? We take it through addition. So two plus two plus two plus two. Here's four times two. And that is eight. Right? So that's why four times two is eight, because multiplication, I'll write it here, is repeated addition. So if you flipped it around and you said like two times four, two times four would mean four two times, and that's another way of saying eight. Right down here, we'll get to four times zero. And just to explain that, four times zero, that would be zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, and that's zero, right? And that's why zero times anything is zero, because you're just adding a bunch of zeros. Um, okay, so four times one, four times one, that is four, because one plus one plus one plus one is four. Maybe I'll write that in red. Uh, four times zero, we did that one down here. That's zero. Four times negative one, so if you stick with the pattern, four times negative one would mean negative one plus negative one plus negative one plus negative one, right? Four times negative one. One, two, three, four. And that would be negative four. <clears throat> Four times negative two. Uh, check, check out a different way of finding this, by the way. Um, as we're going down by one over here, right? Check that out. We're, we're keeping the four consistent. We're going down by one here. What is happening on this side? So we went down by four, right? Eight to four. Four to zero. We went down by four. Zero to negative four. We went down by four. So you can almost do this since this pattern is consistent, right? We're going down by one. It must be that over here, we're gonna go down by four. So from negative four, I go down by four. That would be negative eight. Good, right? Four times negative two, negative eight. Not groundbreaking stuff, I realize. Go down by four again. 
<clears throat> right? So we go down by 4 again, and now we'll have negative 12. So that was another reduction by 4. And um, now 4 times negative 4, we go down by 4 again, and that'll complete that part of the table. So negative 16. Okay. So this part of the table doesn't really explain why a negative times a negative is a positive. Here though, we're going to eventually get there. So now we're going to start, we're gonna keep this negative. So we're kind of holding on to that. That one's this one. And now we're letting the other number decline, right, into the negatives. So that way, ultimately, we'll get a negative times a negative. So this is just the flip of what we had up here, so this still must be negative 16. <clears throat> and this is basically the flip of what we had up here, so this should be negative 12, that same negative 12. And same here, right, this should be negative 8. What is happening here? So it looks like this went plus 4. This went plus 4. All right, so as this one is going down by one, it looks like actually now we're going up by four. <clears throat> so if I go up by four again, negative four times one, yep, negative four makes sense. So that pattern holds. Negative four times zero is zero. So that's another addition of four. And now we're at the moment of truth. Right, so we're finally at maybe a, an, a groundbreaking moment here. So we're at zero, we're going up, sorry, down by one, right? So this suggests that if this pattern holds and we have no reason to doubt it, that what I need to do to zero is add four, right? So from that pattern, this needs to be positive four so that we don't break this pattern. And we have no reason to feel the right to break this pattern, okay? We're just, we're just kind of obeying this pattern because it's there. So that's another addition of four, and finally negative four times negative two is positive eight because that pattern holds. So why is a negative times a negative a positive? Because of this pattern. That's the only reason so to summarize and kind of generalize, if you're taking a positive times a negative, that's a negative. If you're taking a negative times a positive, that's a negative. If you're taking a negative times a negative, that's actually a positive. A positive divided by a positive is a positive. So now we're talking about division, um, which, which is very similar to multiply, by the way. So positive divided by negative is a negative. Negative divided by a positive is a negative. Negative divided by a negative is a positive. What about zero? So positive times zero is zero. Negative times zero is zero. If you flip it around, we still get zeros. Um, zero divided by a positive is zero. Zero divided by a negative is zero. So let me show you an example of that on the calculator. So this button, it's a good moment to mention this button's existence. So that fraction button, use the heck out of that. That's a, that's a nice button. Um, so zero divided by six, that's zero, right? That would be a case of zero divided by positive. Zero divided by a negative, what about negative six? Still zero, right? Down here is where it gets a little interesting. Um, what if we have a positive divided by zero? So what if we switch this around? Six divided by zero, not good, right? The calculator says, nope, that's, I can't do that. Uh, so this is undefined. So this is not a thing. So it's actually not a physical object. This also is undefined. It's so not a thing, we didn't even define it. Okay. 
order of operations. Yeah, let me introduce that or reintroduce it. You, you may have seen PEMDAS, right? And that's what this is essentially. Um, so parentheses, exponents. This is a kind of an order of operations, meaning it's a hierarchy that you work top to bottom. Exponent, multiply, divide, add and subtract. So this, this works most of the time. What I, I have a bit of an alteration though that I'd like to suggest. So I typically write this as G E M slash D A slash S. Okay, and I'll actually talk about the first one to explain why that is. <clears throat> so typically I think it's taught this way. So this would mean that you start with anything in parentheses first, you satisfy those, then you move to exponents, satisfy those, multiply, divide, and so on. The thing is, um, multiply and divide are actually equal in priority. And same with add and subtract, they're actually equal in priority. So we do multiply and divide, if that's all we have, we do whatever one appears first, left to right. So we don't always multiply before we divide. And that's why this, this suggestion is, can be confusing. We don't always multiply before we divide. We always go from left to right if there's a tie um, in, in the order that they appear. So what if, what if we do this one this way? Let's do this one the old way, right? So if I do this first one this way, it would say, okay, start with the parentheses, there are none. So I go to exponents, there are none. I go to multiply, there's a multiply, right? So multiply is right here. So I would maybe say, okay, let's go ahead and multiply. I'll take four times three is 12. This is wrong, by the way. 36 divided by 12, right? And then I would say, okay, I did the multiply like I'm supposed to, and now I just need to divide, right? And you would get a three. Typing it into the calculator, let's see what we get. So 36 divided by four times three. 27, right? That's not the number three. So what, what's going on is if you use this approach, you're kind of gonna make mistakes in certain cases. What we really should have done to do this appropriately is we look for grouping symbols. So instead of parentheses, I, I I wrote a G because it's any grouping symbol. So a grouping symbol can be parentheses, it can be braces, it can be square brackets, even a fraction bar is a grouping symbol, even a root symbol is a grouping symbol. So that's why I wrote G. So that's for grouping. Um, there are none. We go to exponents, there are none. And now we're at multiplication or division so I write it this way to remind us, oh, we do whatever one appears first, left to right. So actually, the, since it's a tie, right, divide and multiply, the first thing I'm gonna do is actually divide. So I'd take 36 divided by four, which is nine, nine times three is 27. Okay. Um, terms, you can work within terms terms are separated by addition or subtraction. So these are the four terms of this expression, right? They're separated by addition or subtraction. I'll write that down over here. So terms are separated by add or subtract. So what you can do within the terms, terms are kind of like another grouping symbol, if you will. So you can work totally within those terms. So what I'll do just to save some time is I'll go ahead and take 10 divided by five and then I'll add two times three. So I'll have two plus six minus 16 plus four, right? I, I satisfied each term individually just to save some time and I know that I haven't violated any order of operations. Now that all we have are addition and subtraction, I'm going to perform whatever one appears first, left to right. So 2 plus 6, 8, minus 16 plus 4. Now the negative or the subtract is first, 
right? So 8 minus 16, negative 8, plus 4, negative 4. All right, so on to review two, I'll do a couple of these. This is operations with fractions, everybody's favorite, right? I'm just gonna do review two in this video. We're gonna do review three and four in a different video. So yeah, what does um, a fraction like three-fourths even mean? So this question. So what does a fraction mean? So if you have three-fourths, let me write up maybe a picture here. So three-fourths. What this means is that bottom number is called the denominator. This is the number of equal parts. The whole has been cut into. So for this example, we'd have some entire object, right? So I'm just going to think of this circle as the whole object. It, I don't know what it is. It could be, you know, money. We could be splitting up $100 four ways. We could be splitting a pizza four ways. We could be splitting, like, lifting a heavy object four ways. It actually doesn't matter. I'm just thinking of some whole entity has been cut into four equal parts. So I'm going to cut that into four equal parts in this case because there's a four here. The three, the three means the number of those parts uh, we're considering. Right, so if it's a pizza, maybe it's the number of those parts that we've eaten. Or if it's um, money, maybe it's the number of those parts that we're gonna give away. Who knows? In this case, it kind of looks like a pizza. So I'll just kind of maybe stick with that analogy. So this, once I shade in these three out of the four, this is a picture of three quarters right there. So that's a, a diagram of literally what three quarters means. We have four parts to choose from, and we choose three of them, All right? Um, just, just to do another quick picture, maybe down here, like what if we had two fifths? So you can draw a different object, right? It doesn't have to be a circle. But you need to cut that object into five equal parts. I'll just call that equal, right? And then I'm selecting two of them, right? So this is a picture of, of two fifths. Um, what if we had seven fifths? Right? What if that number on top is larger? Then we, we can't shade enough, right? So I would have, here's one, two, three, four, five. So I could start shading, right? Here's my five equal parts because of the denominator. Here's those five, but still we have two more. So I would need another whole object or whatever this job or quantity is that we're dividing up to split up and then I select two more so here are five fifths right here's five fifths another name for five fifths is one whole by the way and here's another two fifths so it's one two three four five six seven fifths another name for seven fifths is one and two fifths and hopefully you can see why, right? Here's the one, here's the one, and here's the two-fifths. Um, just to continue that tangent for a little bit, a second ago I said that like six over zero is not a thing. Try drawing a picture for that. Try drawing a picture for this, right? How do you draw a picture of zero parts? Right, if I draw this, that's not zero parts, that's one part. So how do you draw a picture of zero parts of something, right? If the denominator is zero, that means we have zero parts of a thing. And not only that, how do you select six of those zero parts? You see how this just doesn't make sense, doesn't make physical sense? You have zero parts to choose from. 
and you've selected six of them. See how that English actually doesn't make sense? So that's why our calculator is saying air, because it, it appreciates the fact that, hey, that actually isn't a physical thing. Um, zero over six is completely real, right? If I have zero over six, maybe I'll write that here, zero over six, that would be like something cut up into six equal parts. And then I just don't select any of them, right? So this is a picture of zero sixths, right? I haven't shaded in anything. What I'm gonna suggest you do is use your calculator throughout this section. <laughs> it's gonna keep it real. Um, reduce the fraction to the lowest terms. Use the prime factorization if you feel it necessary. Um, you could do that. And I'll show you how to do that after I show you this quick way. So what I'll do is type in 25, first my fraction button, 25 scroll down. So this is like your scrolling around button and 150. So one six. So this is one six. It, it mentions something about a prime factorization. So what that means is if you take a number like 25 you can always break it down into its primes. So if you start factoring it, five times five, actually that's it, right? These are both prime. So 25 would be equivalent to five times five in prime factorization. 150, I'll do that in a different color. Three times 50, 25 times two, and then five times five. So 150, its prime factorization comes from all these primes. So it'd be two times three times five times five. That's its prime factorization, right? That's like its fingerprint. So what you can then do is write, rewrite 25 using its prime factorization. So I'd say five times five over 2 times 3 times 5 times 5. Right, there is a kind of a 1 here, imaginary 1. So once you have 25 over 150 written this way, you can now come in and cancel any common factors. And what are you left with? You're left with 1 over 2 times 3, which reduces to 1 6. But the calculator is much quicker, <laughs> so I do encourage it. Um, graph on the number line, 10 halves. So I'll go ahead and just do this one. So 10 halves would be, basically I'm counting 10 halves, right? Here's a half, here's another half, here's another half, here's another half. So I'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That would be 10 halves right there. Another name for 10 halves is five. Yeah, just some quick, I think, calculator work is what I'm going to show you here. I, I do want to encourage and, and kind of explain how to use this calculator. It's, it's a powerful tool, so please do use it. So for 7, 6, I, again, I'm going to write this fraction. So that was this button. 7, scroll down, 6. Scroll to the right now because you'll be down here. You don't want to type stuff down here anymore. So you need to scroll to the right, hit plus. And then this is called a mixed number where you have some whole parts and some fractional parts. Behind the fraction is a mixed number. So you want to go shift this button and then I'll type three, five over six hit equals. It's the number five. So I'll leave these to you, right? Type those in, see if you can get the the numbers out. You can check the document next to the video against my work. Multiply. So a couple things about multiply um, with fractions. If you have A over B times C over D, right, just some fractions, some general fractions multiplied together, what you do with fractions is you multiply them straight across. So we'd have AC over BD. 
with division, so if you have a over b divided by c over d, then you can actually do what's called inverting and multiplying. So you can switch this into multiply by writing a over b times d over c. So that was the invert and multiply, right? I inverted this part, and then I'm changing this to multiply. Once you have that done, now you're just going straight across like before. So AD over BC. Um, so for part two, let me go ahead and just talk about part two. I can go ahead and switch this. So this will be 5 27 times 9 over 20. Right? So I can flip this fraction, just the second one, and change this operation into multiply. Once you have it there, you can just multiply straight across. And I'll show you how to do this by hand, but keep in mind we could have typed this into the calculator a long time ago. Okay, so if you want to simplify this by hand, feel free. So you want to start canceling common factors. So 9 can be written as 3 times 3. So I'm just breaking up that 9 as 3 times 3. Um, didn't really need to do that, I guess, because there's a factor of 9 here. So I'll say 3 times 3 times 3, and then times 5 times 4. So these factors, those two 3s can cancel away. There is a 1 up here. There's not a 0 left behind. There's a 1. And these 5s can go away. So it looks like 1 12th. I'll check that with the calculator, though. So type this in. Um, so fraction first, 5 27 And then I'll just type divide, 20 over 9. It equals 1 12th. All right, so let's see. I guess that's actually it, you guys. Um, I'll be doing the rest of the problems. I'll attach the solutions next to the video. But until then, have a good one.